So in the last video, we derived the pressure diffusivity equation. We worked an example in Mathematica. And depending on exactly when you watch the video, I've, I've since corrected it, but uh, I might have you might have seen it with the definition 1 over alpha here. Uh, of course, it's completely arbitrary. Alpha is just a constant um, and that we define to represent some material properties. Um, so it doesn't really matter uh, if it's 1 over alpha or alpha. But to be consistent with uh, the literature and, and other notes that, notes that I developed, uh, let's, let's use it in this form here from now on. Uh, that was a mistake on my part. So we're going to do a few manipulations to this equation. Uh, first thing is simple. We'll just move everything to one side of the equation. So we'll just rewrite it like this. And that's equal to 0. And then what we're going to do is we're going to multiply. Uh, uh, of course, keep in mind, or just remember that P, uh, this, is, this, is a full, this is an equation in, in 2D at least, right? We don't have a gravity term, so it can't really be 3D, but um, remember that P is a function of spatial vector x and time. Right? So spatial vector x and time. So I, I won't write that every time, but just keep that in mind. So what we're going to do is we're going to multiply this equation uh, on the left-hand side uh, by some arbitrary function, w of x. This is only going to be a function of space. Right? So we'll just multiply by w of x there. Now, of course, I think you can agree that this doesn't change the equation at all, because I can always divide by w of x and go right back where I, where I was. right? So we multiply both sides of the equation by w of x. We don't change anything. OK, now this equation uh, holds point-wise for any point in a body. right? So if we have a sort of two-dimensional domain uh, omega. Uh, this equation holds at this point, and it holds at this point, and it holds at this point, and it holds at this point. Right? And in fact, it holds at the infinity of all points, right? I mean, er at every single point in this body, this equation must hold. And because of that, I can actually integrate over the entire body. And I don't, don't change anything. So if I integrate over the whole body, I'm just sort of integrating zero, right? If it, if this equation holds at every one of these points, then it's equal to zero at all of those points. And if I integrate over the whole body, it's still going to be equal to zero, right? So I don't change anything. But now, uh, what I can do is Again, I have these wx's in here. So now I'm going to split the integral over the two terms. And in the second term, I'm going to use, if you remember from vector calculus, there's something called the divergence theorem. Right? So I'm going to, in the second term, I'm going to use the divergence theorem. And so what that's going to give me, divergence theorem, remember, is, is how you can convert. Uh, it's, it's one way to convert a, a volume integral into uh, two terms, um, into a, a volume integral over. Uh, uh, let's just work it out. It, it, this is straight from vector calculus, right? So uh, using this uh, divergence theorem or Green's identity, then I have and then I have a boundary can so this this is the first term and then there's a boundary term right so that boundary term is integration over the boundary of the domain so we'll call this partial omega the boundary of the domain uh, and then what's left there is alpha, I believe. 
equals zero. Okay. So uh, this thing. is what's known as the weak form of the differential equation. And the reason it's called the weak form is if you notice um, in, in the original equation, which you know we might call the strong form, in the original equation we have the gradient of P, uh, and then we're taking the divergence of that. So that means we have two spatial derivatives on P that must exist. So P must have a continuity, right? Its, it's derivatives must exist, and their derivatives must exist for this equation to be valid. Uh, in the weak form, and the reason it's called the weak form is because we've weakened the continuity requirement on P, right? Now we just have the gradient of P, and using this uh, green identity, we've shifted some of the differentiation or some of the continuity requirement that was on P onto this other function, W. And if I didn't mention it, this function W is, is completely arbitrary, right? So uh, you know, that should be self-evident from the first step. When we just multiplied this equation, this first equation, uh, by some function, it didn't change the equation, right? The function could be a constant or x or x squared. Uh, it could be anything, and we don't really change the equation, right? Uh, because we can always divide it out. So this is the weak form uh, of the PDE. And if I were only going to teach you about finite differences in this class, or, the, or the, the finite difference discretization technique, I probably wouldn't go through the trouble of teaching you the weak form. But it turns out that this weak form is going to be a consistent theme, or it's going to allow us a formalism that unifies different discretizations from uh, what we're primarily going to use, finite differences. Uh, uh, but later in the class, we'll also talk about the finite volume technique and the finite element technique. And this weak form equation allows us a way to, uniform, to, to unify uh, or to have a formal unification of the, of the three discretization techniques that we're going to talk about. So 